as I said, Child was working at a time when we didn't have a lot of technology, and he was really one of the first systematic archaeologists, and he was dealing with the, the sort of lack of any information about a lot of these things that he was trying to, um, to explain. Uh, in another uh, sort of a big move that seems obvious today, in the 1950s, uh, another set of archaeologists wanted to go out and actually uh, test some of these ideas. And the, the project that came out of this was headed up by uh, uh, Robert Braidwood, and, and really it was also headed up by Linda Braidwood, his wife, who is um, another one of these uh, uh, you know, unsung heroes of, of 18th, 19th, 20th century science, who, um, because of the, 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 the sexism of science uh, and the, the society in general, didn't get and didn't even try to claim credit for the work that she put in, but effectively the Braidwoods worked as, uh, as partners, although she didn't really uh, get her name on all of the publications. Um, uh, Robert was a professor at University of Chicago, um, and he, uh, uh, he wanted to explore the same set of questions as, as child, and his thought was uh, to go and take a look at the area where these plants that were first domesticated would have naturally occurred. And this is another one of those things that sort of makes sense. If you want to study how this process of domestication happened, you got to go where the things would have been that were being domesticated. Um, but it was one of the first times that someone did this in a really um, uh, extended and scientific way. And it wasn't just uh, Braidwood going out. Uh, it was a, a whole team of people. And the place that he wanted to go was um, in sort of the area that's come to be called the Fertile Crescent. Here's a map just of the Fertile Crescent itself. It's this area that goes from uh, western Iran and the, the sort of the Zagros Mountains uh, and uh, eastern uh, Iraq today, Kuwait, um, up into uh, Syria, south, uh, southeastern Turkey, and then down the, um, the, the coast of the Mediterranean. And Braidwood went out and looked at where the plants that became the first domesticates in this area, the first domesticates anywhere, uh, where they naturally occurred. Where was the, the non-domesticated ancestor of wheat? And this is the, the um, area that you'd find that plant growing uh, naturally. And he also looked at where barley was, and you'll notice this is different, but there's also an awful lot of overlap, right? This, this, um, uh, uh, the Zagros Mountains area in, in Anatolia and present-day Turkey. The same is true of sheep and goats, the next two animals that were early, uh, early domesticates, and um, of cattle. Um, and we got two different species that cattle that were domesticated from uh, Bros primogenis, which is the cattle that, that gave rise to all the ones that we're probably familiar with here, Bros taurus, the ones that look like, you know, the ones that were, I've got milk from in my uh, coffee here. Uh, and also there's uh, a different cow. If you've ever been to India or seen um, videos about India, the cows there look a little bit differently. They have this, this hump here, and those are Bos indicus that come from uh, uh, Bos dimiticus, a different uh, species that would have uh, lived in this area here. But again, you know, we're looking at sort of the same area, present day Iran, present day Iraq, for a lot of these plants and animals. And here's just a few more um, of the earliest species. The book goes into uh, greater detail on the different species that were domesticated first, but barley, uh, emmer wheat, einkorn wheat, these are all different kinds of wheats, different kinds of grasses. The natural habitat theory, or the nuclear zone theory, is what uh, has come to be called. Um, the environments that are going to have the first instances of domestication, Braidwoods argued, uh, were going to be the ones where uh, the, uh, the plants that are being domesticated are naturally occurring. It's their natural habitat. Um, and it's the core of that area that he's suggesting is the first place that had um, had domestication, the nuclear zone, right, the middle of it. And so he went out to look at a place called uh, Jarmo, which is right in the middle of that core. If you look here, um, in the, the, the scale is a bit different, but you know, the, the area that was sort of in the middle of all of these, uh, those maps is this part here in the northwest of this map here, um, where all of those uh, plants and animals that were the first ones domesticated would have been found naturally. And Jarmo, it's just there in the northern corner of Iraq, right on the edge of, um, of the Zagros Mountains, the mountains that run in between Iraq and Iran. Um, and he wanted to go out and look at this sort of core area because he thought that's where you would find the first domestication. And he also wanted to test child's theory. And one of the ways he did that is to bring along more than just archaeologists. And this was really the first sort of big 
um, um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, archaeological study. He brought out uh, not just archaeologists, but um, uh, botanists and geologists and geographers and zoologists all working together to address this idea that uh, the child suggested, that the environment was changing at that time and that forced people together into smaller and smaller spots and that's when they learned to uh, domesticate animals. The site that he uncovered, Jarmo, here is a, an overview of it. Um, you know, it is it, much less impressive than some of the things we'll talk about in a few uh, classes, but it's still a pretty substantial um, site. Probably a village of about 100 or 200 people. Um, and what's sort of interesting and amazing about it is that it's, it's one of the oldest sites where we have clear evidence of pretty much permanent year-round habitation. So, you know, these walls, they're mud brick walls, little storage structures, storage pits. Some of these walls have got some stone to them. There, uh, there are sort of stone paving uh, for parts of this. Um, this is a settlement that's 9,000 years old, 9 or 10,000 years old, 9,000 uh, BP to 10,000 BP, uh, and it's permanent. People aren't being, uh, uh, aren't coming here for a while and using the resources that the land gives them and then moving away somewhere else. They're relying on what's, uh, what's being produced here. And in order to do that in this environment, they would almost certainly have to be um, uh, farming. And in fact, we find um, that the, uh, they, they are um, uh, farming uh, barley, einkorn, and emmer. We're showing domesticated versions of all of these plants um, at Jarmo. Um, we we uh, think that there's a, um, at the time it was suggested that this is sort of the beginning of farming, although I think Braidwood wasn't um, actually claiming at this one site it was invented, but he certainly seemed to argue that he was, he was uh, looking at a uh, sort of the time period it took place. We think now it's a little bit uh, older, in fact, than that. Um, Another thing that they determined here is that the, the, all of the, the uh, botanists and uh, 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 palynologists, those who study pollen and zoologists, they determined that actually child was wrong. The Gordon Child's oasis theory didn't actually match up with the ideas. It was a great idea, but it didn't actually match up with the evidence that they were determining. And they suggested that in fact that the, um, the environment at the end of the Ice Age in the Levant was really not that different than it was um, uh, now. Um, the, uh, so ch uh, child's drying out that he suggested pushed us all into oases with these plants and animals uh, is something that probably didn't actually happen. All right, so that's the Braid Woods and their, their nuclear zone model. If you sort of think about what's, what's being discussed there, um, you could say, well, you, you know, you don't actually really explain why uh, these, these plants and animals were domesticated at this point. Um, you really just pointed out where, and you found a site where you have evidence of it happening. And that sort of debunked child, but it didn't actually offer a real, real explanation for why. What made people wake up, wake up one day and say, let's do things radically differently. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, there's a, a turn in, in, uh, in archaeology that tries to look at uh, at societies, at cultural groups as systems. We call it system theory. It's something that was going on in a number of different um, of the sciences. And they particularly liked the idea of imagining societies as systems in a state of balance. And that's why I like my elephant balancing on a beach ball here. Um, th that's the only reason there's a picture of an elephant balancing on a beach ball there is to sort of think about this idea of societies as systems in balance, right? Um, the work that we're going to talk about, the book focuses on uh, Kent Flannery. Um, Kent Flannery is a uh, nice enough guy, happens to be a professor at this place called the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Um, still there. Uh, and um, uh, this is obviously, this is the, actually the only picture I could find of him. I've, I've met him, um, but I didn't feel like snapping a picture of him at the time. And, and I, I, he seems to not really like his picture being out there, so maybe he'd object to this. But this is the only picture I could find of him. Looks a bit different now. This is about 40 years uh, later. Um, Ken Flannery was one of these folks that really, really looked at systems, looked at societies as systems. And he came up with a bunch of ideas. Many other people did this too. He's not the only one. But the book focuses on his work to look at um, what are called ecological models um, of how societies uh, change and maintain balance. Um, the idea of systems theory is that a society, you could think about it a lot like um, a machine. Uh, you could think about it like a machine or even like a living organism. Different parts of an engine, 
do different things, but they all work together to keep the engine going. So the carburetor carburates, uh, the pistons, piston, um, I've already given up on having any knowledge of, of, of car engines. All those different parts work together and the engine works. Something breaks down and the whole thing breaks down. Um, same is true for a body, right? You've got your lungs and your heart and your liver and um, your, uh, all the different pieces that keep all the cells alive. One part breaks down, you're going to run into trouble with all the rest of them. But unlike a body or an engine, societies have this ability to sort of fix themselves when something goes out of balance. So when this elephant starts to stumble off of the, the, the beach ball, it can do something to regain balance. And um, Flannery would argue that uh, all societies are, are built to maintain a balance with the ecology that they're in, right? the natural environment that they're in. And when something changes, they've got to adjust. Right? They, they have um, religious ideology, social structures, technology. Um, all of these things are, are working together most of the time to make sure that most of people get most of what they need most of the time. Right? A society wouldn't work if everyone was starving to death all the time. There just wouldn't be a society there. And so if you've got a society that persists in time for hundreds or thousands of years, that society is, is a system that is in balance with its environment. So um, Flannery looked at this whole question of domestication and suggested that you've got to be looking at it in terms of a, the question of why people would make a change when their system was already in balance. They wouldn't. So something must have happened to knock that system out of balance and the solution that they came up with to get back into to an ecological balance with their environment was to start farming plants and animals. Um, Flannery worked mostly in, in Mexico. He did a lot of work focusing on these sort of uh, less ecologically promising spots. So he wanted to be interested not so much in the nuclear zone, the place that was the sort of the best for these plants to grow. He was interested on the margins, the edges of where these plants might naturally grow. And the reason he, he thought about it that way is that he was imagining the system that was in balance and when something changed that balance, the areas that are going to be most uh, hard hit are going to be the ones where that system was only just barely working to begin with. So if you're living in the middle of a valley uh, which is lush and beautiful and, and it's like you, you throw a handful of seeds out the window and they would grow, right? So you don't need to bother throwing seeds out the window to make them grow. They're just growing naturally. All the food you need is just coming out of that environment. When something messes with your cultural system, you're not going to feel it for a while. But those distant cousins of yours who live way up on the hillside, three valleys over, that have been sort of pushed out of the good turf because you know, they, 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 they didn't get along well with the people who were living there and they sort of edged them out to the place where you know, they're alive, but they're just barely maintaining. Those people on the edges, on the margins, are going to be the ones who get hit first when something changes the system. They're going to be the ones who have to start looking for solutions to that to get things back in balance first. What is it that actually changes the system? Well, Flannery's argument, and I think this isn't actually focused much on uh, in the book, uh, it sort of comes out later on uh, in, that, uh, in that chapter. The, the argument that often comes up here with ecological models and, and systems theories is that by about 10,000 years ago, you've actually really hit the, um, the, the easy carrying capacity for uh, each of the areas that farming is, is starting to appear in. Um, what I mean by that is you've got as, as many people as can reasonably be supported by what's just going to grow naturally in the Levant, say. Um, the carrying capacity, the number of animals or plants of a specific species that have enough resources to survive in a particular area. Well, the carrying capacity for humans by about 10 or 12,000 BC um, was starting to be reached in these areas. And that's why you start to have people on these sort of more marginal spots of land. Uh, until then, 15, 20,000 years ago, you run out of food in your valley, what's your solution? Pick up stakes, walk to the next valley over. Why did that work? Because there was no one living in the next valley over. The whole population of the, the entire planet Earth where human beings could reach and were, were living was not dense enough to cause a problem on a big scale. And, and the suggestion from the systems theories and the ecological model folks is that by 10 or 12,000 years, you actually start to have um, the carrying capacity for the whole planet uh, uh, full of hunter-gatherers reached. 
Um, what's going to get back into balance? Well, it's not going to be enough to just gather the rice or the corn or the wheat that's being produced by uh, those wild animals. You have to help it along. And if you're uh, being hit year after year after year by having not enough food on these marginal zones and you can't do anything to solve that, well, you know what? It's going to be time to do something different. And we know what happens when we stick seeds in the ground. Let's stick some seeds in the ground. All of this is a little bit of a simplification, right? We shouldn't imagine that it was quite that straightforward. Um, and there's probably a bunch of factors that are going to all contribute to this. Uh, the, the climate change that occurred naturally as a result of the end of the Ice Age was going to be a part of it. It's going to probably take a while for that to filter through. But we think population, zone, population pressures are probably um, uh, starting to be the cause in some of the places where we see domestication. Speaking of the places we see domestication, we actually see it happening um, pretty separately a number of different times. We are absolutely positive, without a shadow of a doubt, that it happened at least twice. There is no way to argue that it didn't, because we don't have the people who are starting to farm over here in North and South America uh, doing so with any kind of a communication with the people who are over here in the old world. There's no going back and forth by the time farming takes place. The Bering Land Bridge is not available. We'll, we'll talk about how people get to the New World later on in the class, but um, those methods of getting there are not available anymore by the time we see farming in these areas. Um, farming happens in a number of different places, not at the same time, but definitely, uh, most likely, in independent uh, invention. So all the red areas on the map are the areas where we see farming probably happening uh, de novo, without somebody sharing the idea with somebody else. But people decided to start farming on their own with technology and knowledge that they already had and with the species that were available to them. The very first one here is the, the, the Fertile Crescent, uh, the area that we've been talking about so far, about 10 or 12,000 years ago. That's the first time. But it's only a couple of thousand years later that we have uh, farming going on over here in China as a separate domestication. Uh, New Guinea. Uh, only a couple of thousand years uh, um, after the Fertile Crescent also, uh, where they're far starting to farm um, taro, um, things like that. West Africa, a number of different species of uh, wild rice and, and uh, sorghum uh, is coming out of there. Um, how about this one? Anyone know what's being farmed up here in the eastern U.S.? Basically where we are standing. We got maize being farmed here from Mesoamerica. That's the first real domestication in, in North and South America. Apples? Good guess, actually. But apples, we think about everything as apples are as American as it gets, right? You know where apples originally are, are from, where they grow naturally? Afghanistan. Apples are uh, derived from a plant that lives you know, right about there. Yeah, so good thought. Um, it's actually a, a, a plant called uh, a Kinopodium canoa, which we have uh, probably all seen on the grocery store shelves as quinoa. Anyone tried quinoa? A couple of folks. Okay, good. I should make it like extra credit to do some like quinoa cooking. I love quinoa. It's 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 uh, it's really good for you, and it's got this great nutty taste. It's kind of like rice, but it's it's got more flavor to it. To cook quinoa, it's very simple. It's a two to one ratio. I'm going to add one cup of quinoa and two cups of stock, but of course, if you want a vegetarian meal out of this, then you're gonna use vegetable stock. When this comes up to a boil, drop the heat down to simmer, cover, let it go about 15 minutes or so. Now we're going to marry this. One cup of quinoa cooked up to four cups cooked grain. So you really get a lot for your money. And then fill them up delicious and super nutritious. A lot of different places were, were farmed and uh, they, they did so with the foods they had at hand. And another point to make with this, and we've got the dates here on the bottom of the screen, is that they did it at really different times. 
um, you know, 10 or 12,000 years ago for, for the Mideast, that's the, the Fertile Crescent here, but, um, you know, 8,000 for China, Mesoamerica over here by, by six or 7,000 years ago, Sub-Saharan Africa about 3,000 years ago, Kinopodium quinoa is probably about 2,000 years ago, um, and some of the other things they also did, did um, adopt maize from Mesoamerica up in this part of the world um, by the, the, the time contact happened. Um, why do you think there's this delay in between when people have started farming in all these different places? Yeah, Heather. Yeah, perfect. I mean, they're not going to make this change unless there's a really good reason to, right? If their system is in balance, to use the way the, the um, ecological model folks of the 60s and 70s would have thought about it, you're not going to adopt this um, if you have any option about it, right? If things keep working the way they're working, don't change, right? Don't fix what ain't broken. Um, we think that it's possible, and this is you know, a big generalization that people will pull apart lots of specifics from, but you know, it, one element here is certainly that populations were increasing in each of these areas by the time farming was something that was being introduced in a, in a, a substantial way. It's just a, um, a, a site here that really sort of straddles the, the line between this sort of pre-farming and uh, farming area. We've uh, already heard a little bit about it, but just to, to outline it a little bit in uh, general, it's a site, it's called Abu Huraira, and it's in modern day uh, Syria. And we talk with Abu Huraira about two different periods or, uh, or, or occupations. Um, this is the earliest settlement we have here. It's pretty old, about 11,000 uh, 500 BCE or 13 and a half thousand years ago, so really at the edge of the, the, the beginning of farming, but possibly even uh, beyond it. Um, we um, have an improvement in the area that, in the, the climate of the area around this time that does allow people to be sedentary, right? These are not people who have never stayed in the same place two nights a row in their life. The environment is really good in this area 13 and a half thousand years ago. So in the earliest levels of the site, we do see sort of semi-subterranean houses, these pit houses here. You know, you dig a, dig a couple feet down, build a couple foot wall, and put a roof over it, and it's going to be a really nice house. Um, it's not a house that you can pick up and bring with you. So they're not going to do this unless they're going to come back to this area regularly or if they're going to spend pretty substantial amounts of time there, stay there for a, a couple of years even before they run out of the, the food that's available and then uh, move on. So a little reconstruction of what it might have uh, looked like here. And we're also dealing with larger numbers of people that we've been talking about so far. Um, uh, three or four hundred people. And as a, a group that's, you know, even primarily hunting and gathering at thirteen and a half thousand years ago, that's a pretty large number of people in one space that are going to be living near each other and staying near each other and relying on the food that's being produced more or less naturally. When things start to look odd or difficult or bad for these folks, they're in a really good space to start experimenting with um, uh, different ways of solving the problem. And one of them is going to be with, uh, with food production. Uh, we have, from here's an occupation from the, that first slide we just saw, these seeds, this is what they look like at Ibrahira uh, uh, 1, 11,000 to 10,000 BC. A few, year, a few thousand years later, we've got seeds that look very different on the same scale in what we call Abu Huraira 1b by about 9,700 years ago. Um, we also see changes to the environment here uh, that are not actually reflected in the plants and the animals that are being eaten. So the environment gets less good for wheat to grow naturally, and so you would expect if they're gathering and hunting, there's going to be a decline in the amount of wheat that they eat over time, right? There's less of it around, so they're going to do something else. We actually think that there is some level of sort of management going on at this point before we've actually got full domestication at Abu Huraira. Because the amount of these foods that, don't, uh, that occur naturally in this area don't decrease as the environment gets worse and worse for them. So when we're not looking at full out farming, like we will see um, later on, we're definitely seeing people doing something to the seeds, right? The seeds are different, and doing something to the environment to produce more of those seeds. Then we have the second phase of settlement at this site, at Abu Huraira. Uh, at first, at about uh, 9,700 BCE, or um, about 11,500 years ago, we have um, uh, probably still some substantial reliance on hunting um, and on, on gathering, although there does seem to be a little bit of farming going on as well. But then we have a pretty sharp switch after about uh, 9,000 BCE or 11,000 years ago, we think that the, the land around this, uh, this site and the populations grew to the point where 
the land was not able to support all of the people who, uh, who had lived there naturally. Um, we have much larger populations at this, this uh, phase of Abu Huraira, a population of set of three or four hundred of three or four thousand people, um, all living in, in one place. The, the houses themselves look very different. Uh, instead of, of small um, semi-subterranean houses, we have um, houses that take even more investment. They're, they're fully above ground. Obviously, the picture on, on the screen here, it, it's underground, but that's uh, because the you know, ground levels rise uh, over time. Uh, and in the, when the houses were occupied, they would have been fully above ground uh, and made of mud brick. Um, and uh, larger and, and rectangular houses that really are um, um, not meant to, to uh, be abandoned ever, that they're really intended to be permanently occupied. Um, after about 9,000 BCE, 11,000 years ago, we have um, a strong reliance on uh, on food production. Um, that's both both uh, uh, pastoralism, and they herd goats, uh, and also uh, the farming of, uh, of grains and, um, uh, and cereal crops. Um, this is a pretty big change in, uh, in this uh, area where we really have permanent settlement and, and uh, people committed fully to farming. Now, a population of three or four thousand people, this land is, is, uh, is pretty good, it's pretty productive, but it's not going to produce enough food for three or four thousand people within a couple of days' walk um, uh, without, without substantial modification. There's a really interesting uh, textbook image on, uh, on page 157 of your, your textbook in, in the chapter you read for this section that shows these two settlements um, sort of right on top of each other and you can really get the sense for, for how archaeology works when you're out in the field. The, um, the, the, in the foreground of the image you've got a lower, uh, the, the round occupation and then these larger um, uh, rectangular buildings superimposed above it showing you that change over time as people have, uh, have switched to, to full domestication.